Okay, it's now 101. We're running a minute late here as people are filtering in. I still see people coming on here. Sometimes it takes a few moments for everybody to connect, unfortunately. It's nice to see some of you who haven't seen quite some time, but there is life on the other end of this computer, I guess. Hey, Mike. Oh, Jan, hey. I'm your biggest fan, come on. You know, <laughs> I, gotta, I couldn't miss that opportunity. <laughs> All right. I like your green shirt, you know, don't dress up for my sake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you should I'm see gonna... what I'm wearing below the waist. Uh -oh. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's only Supreme Court justices who can do that. <laughs> it just don't flush it. All right, let's turn my volume up. Sorry for the scary. Right, I'm, I'm going to mute myself here. Okay. And All I'm right. going to get get us started with the introduction here so that we Thank can you. start and finish mostly on time. <laughs> okay, so hello and welcome. My name is Lainey Goldberg. I'm the Director of Education for Madison Commercial Real Estate Services and also the Interim Executive Director for the Association of Jewish Attorneys. The AJA is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization that's open to all. The New Jersey chapter serves the interests of Jewish professionals by providing tangible benefits that assist lawyers in their day-to-day -day practice. Madison is a group of independent but related companies that provide specialty services for the real estate market. Each company excels in a specific, highly specialized area of expertise, and the companies include Madison Title Agency, which provides residential and commercial title insurance in all 50 states. Madison 20, 1031, which is one of the nation's leading qualified intermediaries processing all types of 1031 exchanges. Madison Specs, which provides engineering-based cost segregation studies, which is an IRS approved process for reclassifying components in real estate to accelerate depreciation deductions, deferred taxes, and approved cash flow. And also lease probe real diligence, which provides the various components required for real estate acquisitions and lease portfolio management. If you'd like more information regarding any of the Madison companies or more information regarding the Association of Jewish Attorneys, please let me know and I'll be happy to connect you to the right person. Some housekeeping rules for today. Currently, everyone should be muted. Um, during the presentation, if you would like to interact with the speaker, please unmute yourself. If you can go back to muting afterwards, that's helpful because we do hear all the feedback on everybody's other end of their computer. Um, this will be an interactive presentation, so if you have a question for Michael, please feel free to interrupt him. He will answer questions for you. This program is accredited for one CLE credit in both New York and New Jersey. I sent an email, I sent an email with an evaluation attached to it to all registered attendees. I will also place a copy of it in the chat room. You can download it from there. Um, during and sorry, during the presentation today, I will interrupt the. Michael with two codes. Please enter those codes on the evaluation form and return it to me via email by tomorrow night. My email address is on the form. Also, please, please, please indicate if you'd like New York, New Jersey, or both credits. There is a highlighted in red on the form. It saves us all a lot of time if you do that in advance versus coming back to me a couple of times afterwards asking for credits that I didn't provide you. Thank you. Um, that brings us to today's presentation. Our topics, trademarks, and how the process works. Our speaker is Michael Moshe Feigen. He works from home most days before the coronavirus made it trendy. His office is in Clifton, New Jersey, and he is a patent attorney licensed with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, New Jersey and New York. Mr. Feigen has been practicing law since 2007 with a focus on patent and trademark application filing. Although he loves to eviscerate contracts that fail to properly transfer intellectual property rights or worse, even more so, he prefers to teach what he knows and make intellectual, intellectual property fun and exciting. So if you've never seen someone get excited about filing a trademark or patent, now is your chance. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Michael. Hi, thank you for letting me have you read that introduction. It sounds better when you read it than what I wrote it. Um, with that, I'd like to start with another joke that I've been waiting to do something on the uh, Jewish Players Association to get this joke for, I don't know, two years since we did that thing in uh, the bistro. Anyway, so when I was in law school, it was before the Jewish Law Association existed. And I had two, I had three study partners. One was named Shlomo, Jan, you know him. One was named Mohammed. Uh, one was named, oh, I forget, Khalid. And the other, was just a 
Stom, uh, John Gorlick. We, we needed a token, not Semitic person in the group for I don't know what reason. And he was a bit of a troublemaker. <laughs> Once he went to Muhammad, he said, why are your people suicide bombing Steve's people? And Steve, why are your people oppressing Muhammad's people? Another time he went and said, why are there, uh, why is there no Jewish bar association? There's a Chinese bar association, there's a whatever, all these different bar associations, Latino bar association. Why is there no Jewish bar association? And then he thought for a second before we could respond, he said, oh yeah, because it's called the American Bar Association. Anyway, you're all on mute, so I have no idea if you're laughing. Oh, Peter Ryder, I see you laughing with a small thing over there. Okay, anyway, with that being said, um, because I know CLEs usually aren't my favorite thing, so I will hopefully make this entertaining enough that at least this will be better than most CLEs you are forced to listen to. Um, I can't figure out how to make my screen smaller. I know there's a way. Oh, well, whatever. I won't be able to see you guys. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now and show you stuff. And hopefully I won't share my investments window. Where is it? Here we are. Share. Okay, so right now you are looking at a page on my website. Um, <coughs> so I guess I'm allowed to plug myself too. My website is patentlawny.com. As you heard, I file patents and trademarks. I have a lot of info over here. Patents guide. I go through step-by-step -step filing a patent and all this other stuff that over time I have worldwide patent protection. I have accumulated on my website. And then what we're gonna talk about today is the new trademarks menu, timeline and trademark process. So you don't have to be a registered patent attorney to do this. This is something any attorney can do. However, just like I would touch bankruptcy law or real estate law, I don't recommend touching trademark law unless you kinda know what you're doing. Um, as you saw in the intro, um, I've seen plenty of, uh, quote, regular normal lawyers who do like trusts and estates and stuff I know nothing about, try and do something like me and the, the trademark assignments and they just don't assign things properly. And just it tr the rights aren't transferred properly, just like in real estate, if you don't say certain things, which I don't even know, the real estate isn't transferred properly, it has to be recorded and so forth, whatever it is. Um, I only learned anything about it in law school, which means I learned nothing about it. So uh, everything else is my experience. So um, with trademarks, you have the you have common law rights, which are rights to uh, that you have just by using them. This comes from British common law uh, that United States adopted for sake of uh, when I use a name, if I open a store and it's called uh, Jan Meyer's Gym then even though it's closed right now and going out of business because it has all these expenses, um, then uh, you just by the fact that I, own a, I made a Jan Meyer gym, that means that um, Jan Meyer who practices subrogation and bankruptcy law and all that stuff, free plug for Jan. Um, I'm a counsel at his firm, so um, anyway. Um, what was I saying? Oh, right. So you have rights to a name just by the fact that you're using a name and it's within a certain geographic area, which is kind of fuzzy, 20 miles, 30 miles, whatever it is. Today, kind of everything is on the internet and everything's all over the place. So if you have an online business, there's more of an argument. However, to have something that, for example, Amazon is going to take seriously, you need to have a trademark registration. Registration gets you a lot more. And also Google, if someone is like trading on your AdWords, you need a trademark registration. And there's two types of trademark registrations. There's supplemental and there's primary. So for example, uh, I'll just go here on the trademark website, trademark, and you go down here. This is USPTO.gov. Search the trademark database. Uh, one of them that comes to mind is remote landlord, which is one I filed for a councilman in my town. It was the first one I ever filed on my own. Um, computer software for real estate management. And so the trademark office said supplemental because that's descriptive. I, it's something that tells you I'm uh, being a landlord remotely. So this is real estate management for that. So therefore they went and said supplemental. Supplemental is basically it gives you damages as if it was a common law mark, just the fact that you're using it. Um, meaning you don't get statutory damages, you get like provable damages. Uh, it is now federal rather than local, and it is a trademark registration. You can still use the R with the circle, so it's better than nothing. 
uh, this is where descriptive marks go. However, if you have a suggestive mark, like if you have a trap call, which this is now a semi-famous apps, um, this was by a guy that uh, he started, he was from Lakewood. He started out with this small thing, hiring some developers, and uh, he ended up bought out by IAC, which is Barry Diller's company, USA Networks and collegehumor.com. And now I get to say I have a Fortune 500 company as my client. Um, and what Trap Call is, is it's a, uh, he also does tape a call, which is like ridiculous millions of dollars, uh, millions of downloads on the iPhone. Um, Anyway, trap call it was allowed on the primary register. So you see over here, it says uh, principal, principal or primary. And because uh, what he does is he is unblocking uh, blocked phone calls. So if you call someone and you block your phone number, what this does is forwards to a 800 number, forwards back real quick. And it, it doesn't need to forward, it just shows it over there. And legally you can get the number from there and then it populates on the uh, phone and the app. So it tells you who's calling you. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, blocked phone numbers aren't really so useful. Um, all right, so that's the basics of that. And this now you get you get statutory damages, which are can be very high. They can be I don't remember offhand at least five hundred dollars, up to thirty thousand dollars. Willful damages can be up to two million dollars in attorney fees. Um, suffice to say, those of you who do court stuff know you don't really get attorney's fees in these high damages so often. If a person keeps continuing to infringe and so forth, then it's, it's more likely. Uh, so that is an over, overview of the types of trademark registrations. Oh, and over here, you can see me give basically the same talks in more detail. Um, part two, five, part one, filing a U.S. trademark after filing. This, if you really want to practice trademark law, I would recommend watching the videos. Oh, check this out. I'm wearing the same shirt. Amazing. Um, so I should have worn a third shirt. So when I put it on here, oh, well, um, I didn't think about that. So uh, if you really want to know about it, watch those videos. It's a CLE I gave for another company. I think it was attorneycredits.com. So you could probably go on there and get CLE credits. And those go into detail of the whole process for someone who wants to be a quote unquote trademark attorney. Uh, any questions before I go into the details of the process? Okay, um, you have to unmute yourself if you're trying to ask me a question. All right, so anyway, um, so here, this is the basic process. This is a timeline. Apologies for not updating this graphic in 10 years. I keep meaning to get to it. So over here is basically the timeline. There's six steps. Number one, make sure what you're filing is, has a reasonable chance of getting through. Number two is an internal review. This is at four months, trademark office. They're almost not a government office. They are very competent, especially on the trademark side. The patent side, I don't wanna be on video saying what I think about a lot of examiners. Trademark side, they are very competent. They examine at four months, like within a few days, like constantly. They, they've been operating like normal in these conditions. A lot of them have been moving to working from home. Now all of them work from home. Now they're transitioning, uh, rolling basis. They come back into the office. The office is in Alexandria, Virginia, which incidentally trivia fact, uh, when Washington DC was originally chosen to be the capital, Alexandria, Virginia was gonna be part of Washington DC. And what happened was by the time of the civil war, you had a problem on Washington DC was a free state and slaves would run away from Virginia to Washington DC and it was a problem because there really was no border. Trump did not build the wall yet. Uh, so um, then uh, what happened was the South slipped through an amendment into a bill and if you look at the shape of Washington DC, which maybe if I go off too far, um, feel free to get me back on topic, but interesting trivia fact look at the shape of Washington here. It was supposed to be a three mile rectangle on a nice port over here. And you can see it's got some nice ends over here on the northeast, northwest and southwest corner. Then where's the rest of the square? Well, Virginia said we want our land back because we don't want slaves running away to Washington DC. A river here stops them much better as a natural border, which is why Washington DC is that size. So Alexandria, Virginia, which is down here is where the patent office is. So it's like, why does Virginia get that? Well, to be fair, it should have been part of Washington, D.C. anyway. Uh, these people get to vote and for the president, though, so they got something out of it. 
Um, okay, that's enough of that. Um, now, the internal review at four months, external review, it's rare, it happens. If you file, for example, I once filed, um, it's gonna take me a second to file to find it, um, name it and goal. Um, here, main goal polo. So I once filed main goal polo for Felicity Biggins, it's public record. So we have Biggins and Felicity. And one of the others that I filed for her was this one. Um, shout it out, meaning unmute yourself, then shout. What is the problem with this trademark over here? Why would it have been opposed by a third party? Don't all unmute yourselves at once. Okay, the answer is Ralph Lauren. Ralph Lauren was not having any clothing whatsoever that had a horse in it. I'm just gonna put it here. Trademark office is really slow today because, you know, government website. Google website was this slow, it wouldn't be acceptable. So Ralph Lauren was like, no, you're not putting a horse on clothing. They were gonna oppose it. And as you see down here, it says abandoned. Um, so moving on, that's the external reviewer oppositions. This is basically the, the third party oppositions, it's litigation. It works the same way as federal procedure for litigation. Whole thing, discovery and everything. Trademark office, I'd say is worse than your, not worse, it's however you wanna say this, more so than a regular federal judge. The trademark office does not wanna decide anything. They push off these things and they push off and push off until you get to uh, actually filing legal briefs and so forth. It takes years to come to any sort of decision. What typically happens in these cases is he who has the most money wins. If you're going up against Ralph Lauren and you're a single person starting a business, Ralph Lauren wins. You could be right, Ralph Lauren wins. You could have all the arguments in the world. You could have uh, legal professors on your side. You could have Jan Meyer, Jan Meyer on your side, you might win. Okay, then you have to show that you're using the trademark. So using the trademark, um, once it's allowed, you can file, as you file it, you can show that you're using it already, or you can, after the fact, as a person was using it, they have the common law rights, they can later file what's called a statement of use and show that they're using it. So this typically happens roughly about six to 12 months. You have a six month window to show that you're using it. You can get an extension five times. So you essentially take this from the date of allowance till three years later. And then trademark issuance, um, cautionary thing that once happened to me. I had a mark allowed where the name is eluding me. It was something for popcorn and we had it allowed and he filed extension after extension. Then we filed, we're ready to use it. Then the examiner said, too bad, we're rejecting it now. Like, what are you talking about? It was allowed. They can rescind the allowances. It's rare. It can happen. Suffice to say, I had an irate client and I was irate for him uh, because now he said, well, it's a descriptive mark or it's closer to generic. I can't raise you tissue box for tissues. Uh, that's a generic thing. So this was like a type of popcorn, didn't allow it. So he said, now, well, we're, we're not allowing those marks when he had done it right away. When he had it, he could have he gotten it. That I've seen one time and I filed, I don't know, a thousand trademarks. I saw that one time. Not, not often, it just makes the talk a little bit more spicy. Uh, and then the trademark issues. And then once you get the trademark, it's good for five years. Now you have to actually show use. You have to be using everything that you show on it. So I get trademarks every once in a while, especially the ones that are international that come in from elsewhere, where they go and put the kitchen sink in them. Um, let me see if I can find one. Uh, when they come in from like Japan, now this is one. So um, here, you know what I'll do? I'll do it this way. Um, we'll do, oh, oh. 41. Oh, I'll explain what these numbers are right after because that's a good segue into it. Um, and I fortunately I can't shut off the phone ringing without going to my email. So, okay, so I'm doing one in this freeze just to do one in multiple classes here. Here's a great one. This is World Athletic Championships Oregon 21. I just found it. Oh, this is an amazing one. So they filed all of these goods and services. Just to give you an idea, they filed uh, random things. Fire extinguishers, um, sexual activity apparatus. Can you imagine those being under the same name? Uh, I'll, I'll keep it appropriate for uh, mainly for an audience. 
uh, apparatus for locomotion, jewelry, coloring and drawing books, bags of leather, so forth. I'll just jump down here. Telecommunications access services, transport. Uh, maybe they are using all these things. I tend to doubt it. It, it came in from Monaco. I tend to doubt, doubt it. Because what you see in foreign countries, they can list the kitchen sink and it doesn't matter. They just pay more fees. Um, in the United States, and I, I caution that last statement, it depends on the country. I, I am not an expert in any trademark laws other than the United States, although most other countries are very similar. A lot of this is internationalized. Um, I would find it hard pressed to believe they are using every one of these things. So when they go and file, and we can look at the prosecution history for this, uh, the, then what we'll probably see is, I guess is, well, I don't want to make pivots. Okay, unfortunately it's loading too slow. I don't feel like waiting. Oh, there it is. So you'll see in the prosecution history, okay, they've only filed it. So they have not shown that it's used. When they go to show use, they're gonna to have to show, well, you only have to submit that you're using one thing in each of those categories. However, you have to actually be using everything in the categories. Otherwise you sign a statement that says, I'm selling every one of these things. And when they go to sue someone for infringement to cancel the trademark, whatever it is, the first thing you do is say, you committed fraud on the trademark office, your, your trademark should be canceled. Because there is probably, I don't wanna say there's no way, there's next to no way, there's substantially no way, as we say in patent applications, there's substantially no way they're actually selling everything there. They say fraud on the trademark office, there's case law that says you committed fraud on the government, uh, essentially you can get fines in jail. What, you, what happens is you lose, lose to trademark. There's court cases where people have lost to trademarks that way. So you only wanna list what you're actually using. So going back to the goods and services, there's different categories, so I'll do it this way. Actually, I'll do it on my website. Um, trademark international classes. Here it is. These are the classes of trademarks. I'll just go through a few of them that are most popular. Class nine, and these are internationalized. And the goods and services manual, they actually have ID numbers on everything. So if you file for a uh, shirt, shirt has an ID number associated with it. So they don't even have to do translations when you file from one country to the other. You just use the, um, uh, quiet. Um, you know what, I'm just gonna close that tab. That'll be easier way. Oh, mute tab, even better. Okay, so uh, it, it, it's very easy in those countries that are participating to do it uh, international file in another country. Uh, I'll get to, if I have time, I'll get to international filing. I don't know if I'm having enough time for that. So class nine, for example, this is where all computer parts and stuff goes through recorded media, like recorded CDs. So the first classes are trademarks, which means a mark on goods. The last classes are service marks. So when you go and file uh, entertainment, live musical performances, YouTube stuff, nine and 41 start overlapping. So 41 is the service of providing music. Nine is the recording medium with the music. So now uh, if you're doing like a live performance on YouTube, it's probably in the service mark. If, you're, if you call it recorded stuff on YouTube, it's because now technology has sort of blurred the lines. That is now class nine and so forth. Class 41 is, uh, I'm sorry, 30, whatever it is. Another one of these classes is retail sales. You see that often and so forth. The, the other one that I see constantly is 25, which is clothing. So as long as you're within a class, the fee is the same. It's, it's the fees vary. The lowest fee when you file electronically and you choose their goods from the list, not free form, is $225 per class. You file in eight classes, it's $225 times eight, and the attorney fees go up to, I don't charge double and triple, I, I charge something extra for each class typically. Depends how many they're giving, how much work. I like to do flat fees, plus billable hours. It's just I find easier for everyone. This lends itself to flat fees. Um, any case, that's basically the the system in an overview. Um, are there any questions before I move on to why you might be rejected? Yes, actually, the, sure. There were actually a question, Michael. Um, can an offensive or disparaging word be registered as a trademark? And if not, then does oh. it violate the First Amendment? Oh, very interesting thing. Uh, anyone know Ron Coleman? Well, you're all muted. Ron Coleman goes to my synagogue, uh, lives in my town, and he had someone that uh, his trademark was for the slants. Um, I can't say I'm a fan of their music, 
Uh, however, uh, their trademark is an interesting case. I'm not, legally, I agree with this, hashkafically, meaning uh, do I think it's moral? I don't. Uh, but their trademark, well, the slant, see, the problem is we don't need the, I'll tell you why legally I agree with it. Um, because legally, um, let's see if I can find it. Okay, I can't find it right now. Legally, who is the government to tell you whether something is disparaging or not? So if someone goes and files, I'll give you one that I've done. Oh, I've done the search before. I have filed this trademark, which I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce. You're just going to have to read it. Actually, it's a donkey. It refers to a donkey plate. Um, so in any case, this trademark got through without a problem because why? Because uh, of this Supreme Court case that happened a few years ago that said the, the government has no right to say what's disparaging or not, what, what, is, what is vulgar, or what, what any of it is. That being said, I want to show an interesting, um, he also filed a, if you're not offended by this, um, he also filed a trademark for a patent, rather. This is now getting on the patent side of things. These are all my patents. I wasn't planning to go here. I would have had it beforehand. Um, While you're going there, I'm going to offer out the first code. So I know everybody's anxious for that one. So let's go with octopus as the first code. Octopus. And I don't know why, but it is octopus today. This way everyone's paying attention right now and here's the code. Okay, anyway, you got it. <laughs> if you missed the code, it's octopus. Um, anyway, this is, I can make some dirty puns with that, I will refrain. Uh, so this, if you're not offended by this, you should be. Um, so this one was the same guy who he filed a patent for this, and we called it a dorsal, lower torso, and gluteal entertainment plate. Uh, I came up with that name, thank you. Because I didn't want to call this what it looks like, funnel in the rear, funnel you took us, whatever it is, I wasn't putting that. So in this one, um, the idea is he's a bartender and he has this plate, and he knows I disapprove of it, I told him. <laughs> um, but legally, okay, it's, uh, it's legally, if he wants to do this, he, he can do this. Now, this one, interestingly, the examiner, whose name was something exceedingly Catholic, Marianne Callahan, it wasn't it, something like that. She gave us hell. She kept rejecting this and didn't even read the arguments. And I was just like, yeah, I don't like it either. First Amendment says you can do this. Here's a Supreme Court case, the trademark that says you can do this. You can do this on the patent side, too. And she pointed to the manual of patent procedure. And I'm like, I don't care what the manual says. It's out of date. It needs updating. And I went through and I'm like, hey, you want to see a Caravaggio painting? Art history. It was, I actually got to use art history. Um, if you look at, I really should stop. Um, uh, Caravaggio painted for the Catholic Church. And he painted, in my mind, garbage like this. And he's painting like nude children. And for some reason, this was, this was allowed. And this was allowed by the Catholic Church. And now you have, whatever, I can't start disparaging. You have the Catholic uh, Church has changed a little. And now they're like, no, we don't do that stuff. And I get this examiner like giving us hell over filing this. And eventually, this is the first time I ever asked for it. I said, you don't want to do this. That's fine. I'm not pushing you to do this. I wouldn't push anyone to do it and allow this. I'm getting rid of these things. Sorry, I don't want to look at them anymore. Um, however, I, I, you know, you don't have to, I'm not forcing you. However, what do you have to do? Give it to another examiner. And I actually asked, I said, give me another examiner. I called the supervisors, give me another supervisor. I understand she doesn't want to do this, but she has to apply the law properly. The first time I ever asked it and I got a new examiner right away, it was allowed. That's how I got the patent. Anyway, side story. I find that an interesting story. Glad to be able to tell it at some point. Um, got to use con law for the first time since moot court, yeah, the whole thing. Anyway, um, I, okay, that concludes that. Are there any other questions? Just unmute yourself. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm sorry for the nudie pictures and whatnot. 
um, it's considered art. So again, the government is, doesn't have a right to say what's art and what's not. So therefore, they must allow. Um, it's kind of like the Chewbacca defense, defense in some way. Um, okay. Um, Anyway, I don't know when people are laughing. I usually get a laugh when I refer to the Chewbacca defense. Okay, anyway, trademark procedure. Here's what happens now. Um, when you file a trademark that is rejected, um, I'll give you now Cali is one that I just dealt with. And it was Cali in a ton of them that they filed. This came in from China. I have an attorney that I work with from China that sends me a lot of cases. Um, and this one, let me just pick out the right one. I'll show you the file because there's two of them there. So th this one, what happened was they said it's too close to other ones. And I'll show you what a rejection, the rejection looks like. Now, of course, the trademark office doesn't want to work when I'm giving a talk, which is just wonderful. I, I might have to pull up my file and share that. All right. Um, this is why you don't rely on a government website in a live talk. Okay, there we are, hopefully it'll work. And this is what you see, you can look up any trademark. You can get this from the main website. I'm just sort of filling time as I wait for it to load. tsdr.usbdo.gov or you can find it there. You can type in any serial number, you can find all the info. And of course I got the wrong one. This is the one that went abandoned that they didn't respond to. And this one is another Cali mark. And here I've got the right one this time. And here's what happened. They got, let's open up the office action and the response. In the office action, which is what you call a rejection, an error service unavailable is what you call a government website. Here's the response. Okay, I'll pull up my response. That's loading. Okay, here's what the rejection looks like. They went and said, likelihood of confusion. Likelihood of confusion is a legal standard. That means it's a 13 factor test, which as a law professor said, whenever you have more than four factors, it means there is no test. Um, it comes from uh, court cases. It means are consumers likely to be confused by it and think that there's an association between the two. I had literally a guy who called me yesterday and said, I'll change the name. He filed a trademark for um, Facebook stock options. And he calls me and says, Facebook sent me a cease and desist letter. What do I do? I mean, I'd even charge him a consult fee. Stop using it. Like what? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> like you're not going to win against Facebook. And that is clearly confusing. Facebook stock options they are going to think is Facebook. Uh, I, I was playing on the Wii with my kids who were homeschooling thing who are home. I just kind of gave up the last week. And I, I let's just say Luigi died three times in the next two minutes because I, I was dumber for having listened to that phone call. Um, so this is what happened. We filed Cali, C-A-L-L-I-E, for agates, bracelets, it's, I didn't file, it pre, whatever. They filed and then I got this case for jewelry. Um, and then they got rejected for, here's Cali, C-A-L-L-Y for jewelry. C-A-L-I-I-E for uh, sunglasses, Cali B for jewelry, Cali Girl for clothing, Cali for jewelry, Cali Lee for jewelry. So that seems like a problem. How can you register Cali when there's all these other Calis for like the exact same goods for jewelry? If it's sunglasses, maybe not. The rest are for jewelry. Clothing, maybe not. You can argue that. So what do you do with that? Well, there is a um, logical flaw with this argument. How do you reject over, does anyone want to call out or unmute and say why they think Cali should be allowed when I'll give you a hint, all these other Calis are allowed? Okay, I kind of gave it away. All these other Calis are allowed. That's the answer. This is so diluted. When you have so many Calis allowed, what's one more? So that's basically the argument we make. And I'm like, duh, examiner, on your own thing. Like, I don't have to do the research. You've pointed me to six other references. And guess what? This one's spelled different. There's the, this one, the Cali, the one that's very close, that's for sunglasses. So I argued that one away. And I'm like, the one for sunglasses can't be confusing to the one with jewelry because you have others in jewelry. So now let's focus on the ones in jewelry. Sunglasses is too far away. The sunglasses one has no power to stop someone selling jewelry because those are the jewelry sellers. 
Now it's Cali compared to IE compared to LY compared to, to I, which would be at the end, K A L I, Cali girl, uh, that's 25, whatever it is. So here is my wonderful response. And basically, I argued what I just said. I talked about the Legion. Trademark manual procedure is called the TMAP. Uh, if you ever want to find something, you just go TMAP uh, uh, dilution, for example, and Google is your friend, likely of confusion. It comes up in there and so forth. And you find the citation. They cite all the cases for you. So I don't know how to do legal research. I have not used Westlaw since I was in law school because I just use the trademark and the patent manual where they have very nice citations of everything except for the disparaging case. In that case, I went for another court case. Um, administrative procedure law was very good. I cite uh, the Overpack case where you have to actually provide reasons why you give a rejection. You can't just reject. It happens all the time in patents because uh, these are examiners who are not attorneys. I've never heard of this stuff. Um, so they convey different, different commercial impressions. It's not likely perceived as distinguished. And it could be either of those reasons underlie that pointed out. And then I called it dilution for K marks. And I talked about the, uh, how they all sound the same. And I went and gave a list. I'm like, examiner, you gave six. Why don't you stop there? Here, I did search the trademark database. Now let me overwhelm you with facts. Because when I overwhelm you with it, you're not going to want to file a response with all that because you work for the government. You don't want to deal with all these. You're just going to allow. And because that's easier for you to do. And I go in because uh, I think I'm funny. I went and put, uh, if you notice in this list, I'm like, I listed all of these marks. And I'm like, look at all these marks that use it. This is my client's mark, which I stuck in the middle. And I'm like, hey, examiner, if you read all those and didn't notice, I stuck mine in the middle. I've made my point. Um, not exactly anything I've ever seen any lawyer do before. I don't know if this is the most professional. Um, I care about it as much as I care about wearing face masks right now. Um, meaning I don't care because it works. Um, meaning the putting this in like this, I found works. I found it's a good argument to stick things in the middle. Um, it might uh, tick them off a little. I don't know if they ever read it anyway. Um, you know, I've, I found that to be a very effective argument. And I talk about here's the spelling differences here, all this stuff. No, normally, this is sort of a bit of an outlier case. Normally, if you say something spelled C-L-Y versus C-L-L-I, it's confusingly similar. If I put Microsoft with a dollar in it instead of an S, it's confusingly similar. Basic spelling differences, stuff like that, don't make any difference, except for the trademark office basically screwed up and they've allowed so many marks to be, to be allowed already. What's one more? Um, so that's basically the way that works. Any questions on likelihood of confusion? I feel lonely. Someone talk to me. Uh, yes, actually, there was a question there. Okay. Um, can just color with, without words or design of goods be registered as a trademark? Rarely, really rare, rarely. You've got to be really famous and really distinct. The most common case is, well, the most common, there's a bunch of them. UPS for brown trucks, you cannot have a delivery service where they're saying brown because they are so famous for that. And if you saw a truck coming in that brown, which was DHL, you'd be confused. Uh, they're, they're few and far between. Those cases do happen, though. Um, any other questions? Yeah, did you win? I, I, I didn't realize, did you win or lose? <laughs> you think I'd show you a case where I lost? <laughs> I guess you won. Of course I won. Do I win every time? Yeah, no. There's plenty of cases I lose. There's plenty of cases. You have a client that says to you, I want to file this. I say, don't. They say, I want to file this. I say, don't. They say, I want to file this. Fine, I'll dive into the omelet. It's, it's the same idea. It's like, fine, okay. You want to twist my arm? So what do they do? They get a big disclaimer there. I put a big disclaimer in the, uh, in the email to them, basically saying in nice words, I told you not to do this. I'm doing it anyway. I said, the search results show that we shouldn't do this. You wanted me to do this. Because what happens, okay, I had someone that filed, a lady from Monroe, who they're always fun to, to explain uh, US trademark law to. She wanted to file, it was wonder for, it's not bread, oh, for flour. She finally would file wonder for flour. I said, don't do this. I want to do this. Don't do this. I don't care. I want to do this. I did it. Suffice to say, she got a letter from Wonder Bread. And then she, she's not happy. Why didn't you tell me? What do you mean? 
So just like any other lawyer or nurse for that matter, nurses are worse than lawyers at this I've seen, you document everything. I send emails to the client. I told you not to do this. It's like, why didn't you ever tell me? Here, copy, paste. Here's my email before I did the filing. Don't do this. <laughs> okay, did I lose that case? No, you know why? Because I got paid. Client lost, lawyer always wins, you get paid. Unless you get sued. I, I've yet to have that, well, yeah, actually it was. I was sued once by a guy over a $250 fee that just as an aside, maybe we can get credits for um, the uh, ethics thing. I, I have found the way not to get sued, whether you make a big or small mistake, is talk to the client until they feel like you've heard them and you're good. Um, this, this I blew off the guy, it was very early in my practice and he just, he filed something I told him not to file, first of all. Uh, it was like a method of negotiating buying a used car. He was a used car salesman. So if that gives you some idea. Um, and it, he sued me over charging for the next step. And let's just say, even though my invoice said filing only doesn't include statement of use, now I'm a whole lot more clear in my filing report. It says, here's the cost for future services here and so forth. So I have it in like two, three places. So when they come back to me and people do, because they don't read it, they come back and complain. I'm like, hi, I informed you here, here, and here, leave me alone. Um, they're not necessarily happy. I've lost, I lost a client that way who is still irate at me. And <laughs> what do you want from me? It's documented all over. So as you probably all know, I'd say 90% of clients don't read anything, 10% read every word and find your grammar mistakes. Um, that um, my intern who is listening likes to find my grammar mistakes. I had a, uh, what do you call it? I had a uh, filing report letter. I sent the same one for 10 years. She starts dissecting and chuckling at every one of my grammar mistakes. So that was fun. Um, anyway, she's muted right now. She's chuckling right now, I'm sure. Distinctive chuckle at me. It's uh, not fun. Anyway, okay. Any other questions? All right, so let me move on to, how much time do we have? You're muted. About another 15 minutes or so. Another 15 minutes, oh no. All right, so let me go back to, um, do, we, do we have a specific topic in terms of I can go to international filing, I talk more about reject, let's talk about statement of use actually, uh, because I'm talking about the process. So I'll show you, for example, a service mark and a word mark. So I'm going to go back to marks that have been used. I'll go back to the trap call mark. And I timed out because government website. So you imagine you go to Google and it says, sorry, you search timed out. You have to reload the page. Anyway, instead, what you can imagine from Google is you're using a product for five years that suddenly discontinue it without telling you. That happens. Um, trademark office won't be discontinued as far as I know. So it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, so here, when you show how it's being used, you submit what's called a specimen. So in this specimen, this is class nine. So class nine is for the service of computer application software. So what did we do? We just plain old submitted a screenshot of the computer application software where it says trap call here. And it's, this is what it looks like. Hi, honey, I know you're in a meeting, but my water uh, just, all right. <laughs> my water just broke and I'm on the way to Mount Sinai Hospital on the beach. I don't think it's on a beach. See you there, hurry. Anyway, so these are fun examples today. So that's an example for, you show a picture of the product. I have another one. Uh, this one will be cleaner, I promise. Um, um, uh, for oh, just eluded me. Uh, oh, well, let's do this one. It's a different one for that client. And this is ground penetrating radar. I do that other uh, stupid webinar at two thirty. What's that? I think someone meant to be muted, and he said I have another stupid webinar at two thirty. All right. Anyway, so you can show pictures of the actual products as well. And then when you get to a service mark, when you get to um, something where you're advertising a, cer a certain service, you would show that service. So, um, so for example, bin drop dumpster rental, 
So that is a service, a service of renting stuff. And when you're renting stuff, instead of showing a, a picture of the product, you can show a picture of an advertisement for the service. So you would show something like, trust me, you do. It's taking too long to load. Um, and, and so that's, that's the basics of, of, of that. You either show an advertisement if it's a service, or you show a picture of a product if it is a uh, goods that you are selling. That is a very, I should just give a disclaimer, that is a simplistic view. There are exceptions, there are other things you can show. So in this case, where it was the service of dumpster rental, we showed a advertisement for bin dumpster rental act rather than the product itself. Now, if you had dumpsters and the dumpsters were, were branded with bin drop dumpster rental, then you would submit a picture of the, the dumpster rather than, um, rather than uh, what, what do you call it? The, um, uh, rather than the advertisement for it. Same thing, if you're, if you're doing jewelry, for jewelry, what would you show? A picture of the jewelry. If you're selling jewelry of others, you would show like your storefront or whatever it is. Uh, okay, and then we get to trademark renewals. So I'm gonna go back to the timeline now. And in the timeline, we see renewal before sixth year, before every 10th year. So it's basically, it's, it's like it, you, you, the renewal is between year five and six is the first renewal. When you renew between year five and six, your mark becomes quote unquote incontestable, uh, which means the only way to cancel it is fraud or it's become generic. The example, example of generic is gold card. American Express came out with gold card and didn't bother protecting it. So everyone else came up with gold card. Then they came up with platinum card, then palladium card, then uh, I, I don't know what else. Um, it, it came out with, with all of these things. Uh, then I know uh, a vanilla extract card, that's even more expensive than gold right now. It's like $30 for a 16 ounce bottle at Costco. Anywho, um, side point, I got a seltzer machine, saved me about $400 every two weeks because now I don't need to go to Costco to get seltzer. You go to Costco to get seltzer, you, you know what happens. Okay, so um, point being, um, gold card became generic because everyone had gold card. Amazon American Express didn't protect it. So now it's gone. Even if they were incontestable, it's gone. I gave the example where a person says they're using something and they're not, fraud. You can cancel it. You can get their mark canceled because it's fraud. Um, the other thing is always non-use. Um, so I had a guy that filed carriage boutique and what we did is he was actually using it for a very long time. Um, and here you'll see there's a live mark and a dead mark. So he filed carriage boutique and we did some research into who filed it before and they filed the statement of use. They got the issuance. They showed that they were using it. But what happened? So he wanted to file. And we did some research. And we're like, wait a minute. It's really hard to believe they're still using it. They were incorporated in, uh, they were incorporated in Illinois. The corporation was gone. We couldn't find any website. So we assumed they weren't using it. So we took a chance. Because the chance is they're going to go and give you trouble. So we didn't want that. And of course, this isn't loading. So basically, it's, it, it's, it's a legal brief. And you see that it was a, a abandoned because what did we do? We filed a petition to cancel the mark due to abandonment. So they said it was abandoned. And then my client got his, his mark allowed uh, for that reason. If you're using a mark beforehand and someone else registers after, you have uh, a case to try and get their mark canceled. However, it becomes much harder at that point. So registration is key here. Registration, the first use are really what you want. Because if you register after, you're probably gonna have a hard time stopping someone who used it before. Your trademark could be subject to cancellation. It might, if it's not exactly the same, it might limit the effectiveness of your trademark, how far it goes and that sort of thing. Uh, because as I showed with the Cali thing, look how many Cali marks are there. Uh, the, these marks are very weak. Someone has to be the exact same name. And even then you try and sue them they have arguments against you, it, it's going to make it very harder. Where it, this is why you see big companies, they spend a ridiculous amount of money on research before they file a name. Unless you're Google, in which case they didn't like any of this stuff, a bunch of engineers, they just filed the name Google and it 
worked. If you're Amazon, Amazon spent a ton of money. It goes from A to Z. They have the arrow from A to Z. They spent, they spent who knows how many six-figure amount of money to come up with all that, and it's a name no one else is using. Because Amazon for books, which it originally was for, Amazon doesn't really do with books. You, you don't buy books in the Amazon. That's not what it's known for. So for that reason, that mark is arbitrary. An arbitrary mark, usually from a marketing standpoint, stinks. You have to put a ton of money into getting people familiar with the name from a legal perspective is great. So marketing and trademark law tend to be at opposite. They tend to be at odds because if I want to sell a certain, sell a product that's a great marketing name, I want to call it a one that I just filed, Oral Dose MD. It's another one of those where it's like, that's descriptive. Come on, that's not going to work. Compared to Robitussin, Robitussin, I don't know what Robitussin is. I only know what Robitussin is because my mother forced, put it in my mouth and forced me to swallow it. I don't know it because from the name, actually Tussin has something to do with some pharmacological thing. Even so, it's, it's like a new word, it's a new term made out of that. Sudafed is another great one. It sounds like snot fed out of my nose. Uh, it, it is still a made up word. So those names are easily protectable and they tell a person something about it. They just don't tell you what it is. When it tells you what it is, okay, people understand it more readily. I am not a marketing person. I personally think that's a silly way to do things because I mean, because I'm a legal person that's affected my judgment. It should be something different. It should be something distinctive so it's protectable and other people, if people aren't being confused, they get likely to confusion buying someone else's product, not your product. You don't want that. You want to put money into people buying your product. You want your marketing to be useful and you want to be able to stop others more easily. Okay. Um, any questions there before I go on to the final section? Nope, but we've got about seven minutes left of our standard time at this point. Okay. I believe we get the full hour for 15 minutes. Is that, is that not? Yeah, you do. Okay, You'll fine. You want me to go on? I'll go on. Uh, what's that? No, you can, you can finish up the section. People will get the additional credits, whatever we fill up. So oh, I do cool. make sure it exceeds. Cool. I get double that. Um, okay. Fine. So is there any other topic or questions people want me to talk about in trademark law before I go on to a little bit of uh, international? Okay. Actually, let me go on to something that's more practical for attorneys here. Um, practical issues with, I'm going to turn off my video now um, and just talk to you. And we're going to do a uh, stop video. Okay. So, oh, wrong thing. Not stop video, start video, stop share. Okay, that's what I meant. Okay, so, um, so a few practical things. When you transfer a trademark, it's like recording a deed to property. Intellectual property is like property without the dirt that you made up. Property exists, intellectual property for people who don't like to get their hands dirty, including lawyers who don't like to get their hands dirty because I don't like being in the muck with... Uh, Litigation is not for me. Let's just put it that way. So um, when you transfer a trademark, you have to be clear who owns it, what entity owns it, and that entity must be using the trademark. If that entity is not using the trademark, so for example, um, the trademark is owned by Jan Meyer, but all of the sales are done by Jan Meyer PC, then Jan Meyer PC is using the mark, not Jan Meyer. So that is a distinction which matters. There have been court cases where people have lost and their trademarks have been canceled over something silly like that. So what do you do with that? You make sure the owner is who's actually using it. You can have a license agreement from one to the other. So therefore now the owner is using it because they're licensing it to another. Like when they do stuff like filing their wife's name and stuff like that, their wife can own the trademark. She's got to license it to the company, uh, that sort of thing. The other thing is trademarks get, it, it get transferred by not only the registration number, not only saying the rights, typically we would say the goodwill associated with it because the trademark is a registration. That is the quote unquote physical thing we've created. It also has this other intangible stuff <coughs> that despite your registration stays intangible. For example, um, the, 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 the fame of the mark, how well, how well it's known, what do people think about it? That's called the goodwill associated with the mark. So when we do an effective transfer, it's gotta be the, um, the trademark registration itself, the goodwill associated with it. Uh, and you cannot just decide, this is worse when people transfer patents. You cannot just decide, 
this person is going to be the inventor or this person is just going to be the owner. These are matters of law. They're not matters of, I feel like deciding this way. So that's the other major mistake I see. Sometimes I've seen in contracts where we're transferring all of the assets of one company to the other. Whether or not that works with trademarks, I don't know. I haven't investigated it well enough. That being said, I highly, highly recommend that anytime you're transferring assets, there should be a schedule. It should specifically talk about trademarks. It should specifically say all of the aspects of the trademark, the registration number, the name of the trademark. So, the, so if you make a typo, there's no mistakes which one you're referring to. Uh, I've seen that too, mistaken numbers. I can't say I've never made such mistakes. Um, we all make mistakes time to time. However, if you list the trademark number, the registration date, uh, all of the relevant data about it, if it's a logo, put the logo there then those are, I would say, the better practices to do to make sure that uh, the trademark is properly transferred even when you're transfering other assets. If it's a, your executor of an estate and the, someone owned this, then you've got to transfer the assets into the estate. I don't know enough about wills and trust law. I have had it happen, so what do I do? I consult with the trust and, uh, the trust and estate lawyer. They consult with me, hopefully, and uh, then we make sure it's transferred both ways according to all these laws. And then I will typically say, let's include a standard trademark assignment of ownership. So we're gonna assign ownership from one entity to the other. Let's just not assume it's done based on the uh, probate or I don't even know the terms, unfortunately. Uh, and then it's, it's gotta be recorded at the trademark office. Just like you record property, you, have, you, you record the transfer of ownership at the trademark office. Patents, interestingly enough, do not have to be recorded. However, in every case, you will do that because first to record wins, just like I think, just like with New Jersey with property law. Uh, any final questions in the last two minutes? Nothing else has come up. If somebody else has them, they can either mention it right now and mute themselves or put it in the chat room. In the interim, I will give you code number two. Oh, wait a minute. Actually, before I do that, there's a, there are a couple of questions that came up. Actually, I'll give you the, the code anyway, just since I said that. The second code will be DEED. It's D D E E D. Okay, and here's the few questions. Um, first one is, if same spelling but different industry, no reasonable confusion likely successful, BRP for logistics and shipping? It depends. It very much depends. Uh, if you are, if it's a famous mark, if it's Coca-Cola and you file Coca-Cola with a different spelling and you're selling computer parts, don't do it. It's a famous mark, you're gonna lose. If it's, however, if it's a mark for, um, uh, what do you call it? If it's a mark for, I don't know. If it's a mark for Cali, for example, and now you're doing Cali for computer parts there, you're probably fine. I haven't searched computer parts, but at least over the one in class 14 for jewelry, that would be fine. All right, next question is what about international filing? You want Correct. To Okay, so real quick, every country has its own thing. There's a Madrid protocol, which was signed in Madrid, with, uh, I don't know how many, 100 years ago, something, which you file, it's an international filing system where basically you pay a fee for the application, you pay a fee in each country, it then goes into each country, or you can file direct into each country. If you do it that way, you either get a new filing date or have to do, generally speaking, it's, it's complications here. Within six months of your US filing date, you get that filing date in another country. Um, some of that also depends which country you're dealing with. And um, uh, what else do I want to say about that? Um, and basically you pay a fee in each country and it makes sense to use the Madrid application. That will make sense when you're filing in a lot of countries because then it becomes cheaper. It's like 1500 or something just for the basic filing and you would choose a few countries. However, if it, so it's a lot of times if you're filing say just in Canada, a sensitive made Canadian associate is cheaper, easier, less bureaucracy. If they're filing in Canada, Europe, Australia, India, Pakistan, Israel, wherever it is, then you do the Madrid filing because it just streamlines the whole process that comes out cheaper. However, if you get a rejection in one of those countries, you then need a local attorney to deal with that and file a response. Thank you for that. Anybody else have any questions? You can either, as I said, unmute yourself, put it into the, the chat room. I'll give everybody a couple of seconds, but as a reminder, I'll tell everybody that they should complete the evaluation form. Please, please, please circle the, the uh, CLE certificates that you need. 
I'll make sure that it gets returned to me by tomorrow evening. And uh, my email address is on the form. And I, of course, I sent you all the invites. If anybody there, I don't see any questions coming through, but Michael, thank you so much for your presentation today. It was a great job. Uh, anybody else before we go on? I will include your contact information within the certificates as I distribute them to everybody. So if anybody has any further questions for Michael offline, they can certainly reach out to him or email him directly and ask him those questions. Michael, thanks again. One, thanks once again for your presentation. I wish everybody to stay healthy and safe. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks Thank for you having so me. Much. You can reach me patentlawny.com or patentlawnga.com. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Have Bye. a great day, everybody.